Hello and welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. I'm Richard and I'm Julio and today we have an amazing friend of ours, Cindy, on. Hello, Cindy. Hello, Richard and Julio. So nice to be here with you. It's lovely to have you too. I've known Cindy for many years now as one of the top surrogacy lawyers in Canada and I've worked on many different cases throughout the years and as we've done a couple of podcasts, one on trans fertility and then also another one with a trans woman talking about her fertility journey and then Cindy reached out to me and said hey I think it's time for us to do a podcast Cindy why did you reach out I wanted to be on your show <laughs> but also the main issue is because I thought it would be really good to share a more personal story that I have in my family, which involves my youngest child who identifies as trans. And I thought that would be something that we could talk about on your show to reach out to other people, not just the children, but the parents of the children who might be feeling alone, bewildered, and a whole host of other big emotions. And I'm so glad you thought it was a great idea. Yeah. We're thrilled that you're here. Because when I was growing up, I always remember my godmother saying to me, I'm really worried for you as you get older. How is it going to be for you in life? It's going to be really difficult because you are different. You are part of a marginalized part of society. And obviously now that's changed. Whereas obviously I wouldn't say being gay is mainstream, but it's no longer as it was. And I think that really for me feels like what a lot of trans people are going through now yeah that's a really good comment because when um my child who is born female with female reproductive organs and named janelle first told me over almost two years ago that she thought she was a lesbian my first reaction to her at that time was Okay, thanks for sharing. But then a few minutes later, I thought to myself, wow, imagine hearing this some time ago, maybe even five years ago. And I'm in Canada, in Toronto, which is a very accepting place. But I thought, if even five years ago, my first reaction might have been, okay, honey, I love you, I'm supportive, but this might be difficult. And I no longer had to feel that way when she told me that she was lesbian. Then this year, they decided that their pronouns were they and him and wanted to be called Lennox and identified this fall as trans. And I did think this is going to be a bit tougher because it is. But I can say that the same way that you thought the five years ago, it was, it could be a difficult decision to make. I could say there's everything that we're not forcing and then there's something that is innate with us. I've always felt like I am not doing anything wrong. I'm not choosing the hardest or the most difficult path. Who would want to choose to go against your family, to go against? No, I just, I was feeling in my head, what is going on? Why is this so difficult? And why is it received like that? But then again, I felt like there's, you can be in the wrong side of history or the right side of history. And five years later, the lesbian aspect of it wasn't an issue. Five years from now. Let's hope. That's why we're doing this. It's not really for me to have an hour to vent with my friends. We did that before the podcast, but with everyone. But it's not that I feel, and I don't, and I find it hard to believe that most parents, at least here, would feel that their child is doing something they don't believe in and they disagree with it's more of how am I going to help make life smooth for you which is something I think we all feel as parents every day we you have a baby and you're suddenly hit with the magnitude of responsibility and you go oh my god how do I keep you safe from harm the rest of your life and some parents go to the extreme and others say you've got to fall to get up so for me now it's about all right how do I I support this and we joked before about what my boundaries are with my children and as I told both of them whatever they talk about but particularly with Lennox my boundary is 
vegan. I'll support you, but I don't want to eat cardboard in the house. I apologize to the vegans out there because I've recently just had the most amazing piece of chocolate cake in a restaurant that they said was vegan. I may have to look at my boundaries if I can get that, but <laughs> it was full of sugar. <laughs> so, so, but really with her, it, with them, it's a question of getting used to it and then doing the research to find the supports because Lennox is was just 12 when they told me this and almost 13. And so whatever our children may tell us at such a young age, it's still incumbent upon us as parents to find the support to do our own research, whether they want to be a tap dancer or a hockey player. We don't just send them off to go do it and say, great, go find a course or go find a club. We have to find the support. I remember talking to my parents when I was 12 about my sexual identity not being as they wanted it to be. At the same time, I remember also saying, I would love to drive. So they asked me, it's cool. What do you want to do when you grow up? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm a taxi driver. Because cars are cool. But is the dichotomy of you, especially you as a lawyer, you can understand that kids couldn't be left alone or make decisions or vote until a certain age and then there is making decisions yes. like this and you said something very important which was how do i make their lives smoother and no matter what they're going through and because if people will be like yeah she's 13 she he or she or they is 13 12 15 they might change your mind then marriage wouldn't even be legal because people get divorced and nobody tell you, don't ever get married. You know, many years ago, we did marry our children at age 13. <laughs> but, but then again, they were all de dead by 24. So thankfully, we're not going down that route. But what I did in, in, in our case is I, when they first said lesbian, I think my biggest shock was you have sexual feelings at 11, 12 years old. <laughs> Like, whatever they are, I don't, I don't care, care, but what are you feeling? Like only a few months ago, you were running around pretending to be a puppy and making me feed you off the floor in a bowl because we have a dog. Like, and then you wanted to be a unicorn. So is this that or is this a real feeling? And so we talked about that in a way of what is it that tells you this? So it's about being curious and having the child share what their experience is or, or in the best way they can articulate it because that's another hurdle for the parent is how can a child at that age articulate what's inside when it's something they may not be used to seeing or understanding in social media on television pop media right it's a little bit better portrayed now so they can relate better and they have education in schools and they talk about it in schools. So it's not as strange as, sadly, it must have been for you. Um, so they articulated not really having sexual feelings, but just knowing that something was different. And we were fortunate enough to be going to San Francisco for one of the conferences that I often see you at, Richard. So I took the girls because it was their March break. And my older daughter went makeup shopping with a colleague of mine. And I took Lennox to the Castro neighborhood, which is the well-known Q community. And I saw it. I saw it in her body and in their face. Or I just saw something. And I watched it all afternoon. And then at the end, I said... Can you express how you're feeling here? And the words were community. I feel comfortable. This is my community. And it didn't mean I want to have sex with women. I want to kiss women. I want to touch women. It was just a sense. That was the best we could get, but I could see. That was really special. And then they got me this bracelet from there. So that's why I always wear it. Why? Yeah, and the, this one my other daughter made for me, so that one's always up. But this is from Castro that day. I think what for me is really amazing is a lot of people will say is she's 12 or he's 12 or they're 12. Their brain is still changing. Their brain is still forming. They don't know what they want. How do you know that they're not going to change their mind? 
And I think for me, it's, it's a phase just doesn't resonate with anything that I yeah. went through. So I've got two questions. Did you see this coming? After the fact, we tend to look at our lives under a microscope. Uh, I used to be a criminal lawyer, and this was something we would do with all witnesses. because I always knew they were going to do that. But if I look at factually, my oldest daughter loved playing with dolls and makeup. Lennox liked trucks, cars. Wasn't keen on dolls and Barbies as much and didn't watch me do makeup and didn't ask for it, didn't ask for their ears to be pierced like the oldest one did, things like that. But wore dresses and then, in fact, last year did ask to go have the big day at Sephora and get all the makeup. But within 10 minutes, wanted out of there and said to me recently, I think this is who I am because I also don't want to wear makeup. I don't want to do all the facial things that the other daughter does, masks and stuff. And so that doesn't itself mean anything. But there's definitely a, a noticing on her part that or their part that they're different. And I do want to comment on the fact that I do go back and forth with pronouns for the parents. My child feels very safe with me. I'm the first person they discussed it with outside of close friends at school and very proudly share with those friends that they told. They also said, I know, mommy, you're very old, so you get a pass on the name and the pronouns. <laughs> In this case, I didn't dispute it. They know that I support it. And if I sometimes say Janelle or she or her, they're not offended by me doing it because I'm not perfect, but they know that my love and my heart are in the right place and I'm getting so much better at it. It's a question of habit. But there are other people they know the difference, those who refuse to recognize it. And that can be in your own family. And as a parent, very important to address that with the other members of the family. Yeah, and you said something very important because especially I, ca I cannot imagine what it's like to be a mother and having your baby with you and just waiting to pick the name and doing research and getting the right name, falling in love with the name. And then it's something that is your creation that it, whether you support your babies, all of them is still, you're taking away something that I really was very proud of. And the pronoun is just as when you don't have to know, I feel like we need to get to a point to refer and adjust the language and to refer to things genderless and, and people as people, and that will go and it will happen. But in the meantime, it's one thing when you do it to hurt somebody and one thing when you're, it's just like part of the conversation is something new we're adjusting and yeah, but it was meaningful that they gave me permission, right? Cause they, Janelle is named after my mother, Jenny, who has passed. So it's a, it is an emotional name, but they have not decided to do this out of just respect to my mother, their grandmother. This is something different. And I happen to love the name Lennox. I think it's super cool. So it's just a question of an old person getting used to it, but still being respectful and being able to go, oops, sorry. But I think that's really important for them to be able to say, I know you're not doing this maliciously. Your intent is good. You messed up. And from our perspective, and I do this with some of my trans friends, I'm like, oh, so sorry, I messed up. Right? It's fine. Yeah. But I think if you do it continually or you do it with malicious intent, that's a different story. And I think yeah. that is where a lot of people struggle when, when to your point of in the family, if people are doing it out of, out of spite or maliciousness or just... They just don't want to be nice. We had an episode where we went to a play that a dear friend's daughter was volunteering in with a bunch of children with mental health challenges at a group home. And I took, Lennox wanted to go to the play and it was Finding Nemo. It was adorable. And my friend's family was there. Her father came from another province and the good, another good friend. And my common habit of course, introducing is the way I introduce. And it's not very often that I take my child into a room and introduce them to new people. So I automatically said, this is Janelle and blah, blah, blah. And later, and I didn't even notice it, but my friend later came up to her in the car beside me and said, 
So do you still want to be called Janelle? Because I noticed your mom did that. Or should we correct that to Lennox? And I thought that is so supportive of my friend. That's like loving my children. And I talked to Lennox about it later that night. And I said, you didn't even notice because that was a situation that hasn't happened in our new world. And I reverted naturally. And Lennox said, I understood that mom. It's perfect. That is amazing. We have to give the parents the okay to mess up as long as it's done out of love. But the big difference is when other family members say, I'm not doing that. I disagree. We cannot enforce that either. We have to be respectful to everybody and say, I can't make you do that. But I will continue to say Lennox in front of you and if you want to call Janelle or whoever situation it is that's up to you and I've had that and I have noticed after five months or so they're coming around and rightfully is when we set boundaries and we're on what or when we in psychology when we learn more about ourselves and then we get self-awareness we start imposing our way of being to other people. And we're basically asking them to deconstruct your entire belief system without any in, like invitation to do just so I can be. And that takes a lot of work and not everybody has the ability to deconstruct your belief system for somebody. Some people celebrate your growth and so people will criticize your change. I have to say that what understanding that and seeing it and Lennox's reaction to so many of these situations has made me see them in a very different perspective. I've always known they were a pretty special kid, but I think so brave and phenomenally empathetic to those around who aren't supportive even that child is just so remarkable and i say power to you honey um, <laughs> which is amazing and i think so i i have a question so lennox goes to an all girls school how have they handled this situation as an institution and also how have lennox's friends handled this phenomenally well so as i said some of her close friends knew or their friends knew first and were very happy. They encouraged them to share with me because they know me. It's a small school as well. Everyone has pronoun buttons to know each other. There is a non-binary bathroom. So they immediately referred to them as Lennox when that was a choice. And when I first realized the school was doing it, they didn't even come to me and say, do you know this? They just respected their decision to use that at that place and didn't feel they needed to tell me. And it didn't bother me because if my kid wants to be called unicorn and they want to let her run around like a unicorn, I don't care as long as it's not harming anyone. It's their problem. But when we had the first parent-teacher meetings in the fall, the guidance counselor presented me with the worksheet with some comments from the teachers, all which, of course, were very positive. I have to throw that in. <laughs> but on the name, on the top, was like Janelle, last name, and then Lennox. And I knew at that point, and I said, that's interesting. Lennox is on here. And they said, yeah, we've been using that forever. And some of the teachers, because she'd been there for a while, had still reverted to Janelle every now and then. Her official name is Janelle on the school board records and stuff. So that comes in report cards. But you know what? They misspell Janelle because it's so many different ways of spelling it. To to my daughter, to my child, it's like misspelling the name, not calling her Lennox. It's the same little annoyance, right? But we don't get up in arms. We just say it's this spelling. Some people might, but I don't. So the school's been great. Friends are fantastic. They felt at some point with this revelation of being trans that maybe there was less support for that because there weren't as many people. But in fact, there are a number of young people at that school who are feeling that way. So the school offers that support. And there's a 24-hour hotline, a suicide hotline for children that is also manned by people just to talk about sexual 
gender issues and feelings. I don't even like saying issues. Like it's, a, I don't know what to call it for lack of a better word, but these things, these topics, so that they aren't alone. And so our, I called our regular doctor and said, this is what's happening. And a referral was put in right away. It's a four to six month waiting list. So we're not in yet, but I made it very clear that I didn't feel comfortable taking a fast leap into hormone or surgery treatment. If surgery is not available at this age, but even if they were older, I think one has to take a lot of time to ensure it may not be a phase, but there may be varying degrees for their own acceptance. And the frontal lobe is not developed yet. So letting my 12 and 13 year old child decide what to do with their body is completely, but their body is different than saying, I want to wear jeans with a hole in them. And, and also expecting for somebody at 12 to be completely vast of knowledge of who you are and are your feelings and where they are when we have never had emotional intelligence, let alone stigma around mental illness or mental anxiety, depression. And so is, I feel like we have a very limited vocabulary to emotions and then for somebody to expect just to be different, to be an expert in the matter when they don't even understand what they're really, how to put it into words. Like the best thing that we can do is I do believe that it's very important to have structure. It's still your roof, still your house. You still are the parent and the like principal guardian of your kids. And then there's also, I don't want to make you suffer. It's, it's like in this case, in this house, like they call, they're called Liliana and Alexander, but she doesn't like to be called Liliana. So she goes by Lulu. Has Lennox ever come to you thinking about the prospect that all this is too much, that the change is too much, it's debilitating emotionally, physically, and then mentioned anything to do with suicide or anything like that because you did mention a suicide hotline so i was just wondering if that is a conversational topic that has ever been broached so there was actually a short period of time a year ago in school i was away probably with you again richard in australia we did that and i took an extended time there so I was away from home for about three and a half weeks. That's the longest I've been on one of these trips. And the school, school called to say that there had been a lot of upheaval in the class with one of the girls who had a lot of mental health issues. And they were asked to write about emotions. And she was Janelle. And she then wrote about feeling um, alone, suicidal, or that somebody was going to jump out from a closet and kill her so they wanted to bring that to our attention and that's when I started getting therapy um, for them to find out and I do wonder it didn't come out at the time but it's coincidental with starting to feel they were a lesbian and wanting to use they and them pronouns it's also young girls hormones are raging at this time and she came into puberty around this time as well so there was so much, and I think even without the sexual identity um, situation brewing in young girls at that age, this is a time, and that's why we have the hotline in Canada, because teenagers are just full of big emotions, and the timing is wonderful with the coming out of the, film, the second part of Inside Out, which is a film... I think people need to see every year with their children, one and two, because you remember so much more. They've done that so beautifully. And it's so important to discuss it with the children at this age and what their feelings are and understanding that sadness had a good place. Sadness is important. And you can't have joy without sadness and anxiety is bad but it's also normal and you know and you got to watch how it grows and so you can use that film parents can watch it together and with their children and talk about those things in a way to get the kids talking i'm very fortunate in canada we pay extremely high taxes but we have phenomenal social services and this hotline is free and the program at sick kids for teenagers is free and What's if there's the medication 
It's a 24-hour teenage suicide hotline manned out of Toronto. In fact, one of my best friend's daughters is a volunteer with it. It's volunteered by other older students as well as adults. But that happened, and I haven't had that since because they immediately, I believe, got so much support, not just in the community, but at home. The most important thing, I believe, my value as a parent is to provide emotional security for my children. This has to be safe. For the parents as well, you as parents are not alone. There, You may not be as fortunate as I am to have the clinic in a big hospital, but you go reach out to your doctors. I bet you'll find other parents in the community. It's just like when we were going through fertility treatments. And in my world as a fertility lawyer in Canada, everybody suddenly opens up to me and says, I had this treatment, I had that treatment, I needed that. It's not as obvious with two gay men. There are a lot of women who just needed a little bit of help. And they came out of the woodwork. But when I went through my own infertility experience, I never felt more alone in all my life. And maybe that's triggered by, by making, making sure, sure my child, who's young, never has to endure that. Yeah. And I also feel, I also feel like that I always, ha because in my situation, when it comes to my family, I don't want to just abandon the side of the, what it takes for women, for my mother's generation to get married, to have a career. Even now, there are people that are telling, don't get too successful because then you're not going to marry corporate and then you're not going to, you're going to intimidate people. You're, you're never going to get married. So I understand that there is people that work really hard to get to the life that they wanted. And once they have their family and suddenly they have this change they have the right to keep fighting for what they want and then to see where do we meet in the middle. And I don't think it's, it's fair to just immediately consider these people as wrong, but to understand that the same battle that these people are going through, some of the people have gone through in different aspects. Yeah. I had to laugh when you talked about that because my paternal grandfather said to me when I was 13, Sindala, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I don't know. I might be a human rights lawyer because I was always fighting to save the seals or something. And he said, don't get too smart. No man will want you. And yeah, he was right because I was 42 and still single. And, and then that marriage even didn't work out. But I was a strong, independent woman. On the other hand, I had my mother who said, your dreams are so big. I'm afraid there is no man that's going to provide them for you. You better do it yourself. And I don't think she quite meant it the way I took it. <laughs> I, I can guarantee she, I can guarantee she had it worse and I can guarantee she made it easier for oh, you yeah. than what she had. And I can guarantee she was saying, no. don't go through what I went through. No. And my mother was the child of the Holocaust. She was in hiding for the informative years of her life. So even though Lennox was named after her, I think if my mom was alive today, both my parents, they'd say, love is all that matters. Yes. Are you happy? Can you be happy? Will you be happy? And they would probably in old school say, oy, oy, this is worrisome. Why are we going to do this? And I would say things are different. And that is so beautiful. And I think just to your point of education, thank you for doing this today. I know it's a lot and I know it's a very personal story, but thank you for educating and thank you for explaining to us your story. And also highlighting to other people that they are not alone. Parents, children, anybody going through any struggles, you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, so, and what I, what I would like to say is that it, all it takes is that one person that is there for you to say, if you fell, are you okay? Dust yourself up, go again, and sometimes see your value when you don't even see your own value. And for the parents to give yourselves grace to, to accept that you're not going to get this right away and every day, and you will make mistakes with your children, whether it's this or hockey leagues, yeah. you might have picked the wrong school. You might have picked the wrong shirt. It, everything's our fault as parents. We accept that, but this shouldn't be 
thought of as that much different when you're berating yourself as a parent. You've got to give yourself grace so that you too can stand up when you fall as a parent and model that. So you need to have your kid fall and come to you. You need to have your kid go through something and come to you. That is that that is what family really is. Yeah, and this is one of the main things that the psychiatrists are teaching in the families that are dealing with high anxiety children is you've got to let them be exposed to adversity so that you're showing them that you have faith that they can get through it, that you believe in them. If you're always hovering over them and let me do this for you, let me fix this with your teacher for you, you're just, the message is, I don't think you can do it. I have to do it for you. Yeah. There is a message that I heard that said, it was a girl saying, you, I wanted to do the sports class. You didn't think it was strong enough. So you didn't let me go to sport class. So it was never strong enough. There you go. Just be you. Like I, I, I say this over and over, be you, be kind. And I believe there's three types of people. The people that are going to love you for you, the people that are not going to like you for you, and the people who don't even know you will ever exist. So find the people that love you for you. Yes. Cindy, thank you so thank you. much for talking about your story and Lennox's story. I'm thrilled. I, I'm thrilled to have you on the podcast. You've always been amazing. So thank you very much. And uh, as, as usual, if anybody has any questions, they can DM us, share, subscribe. Thank you both very much. This was a, a, a blessing and a wonderful privilege. Thank you.